Borneo, the third largest island in the world. It contains the oldest rainforests on Earth and a third of all flowering plant species. Borneo is home to many animals, some of which are found nowhere else. It is one of the few remaining habitats for animals such as the orangutan. From the year 2007 to 2010, over 120 new species were discovered here, and many more are still waiting to be found. Borneo contains some of the most unexplored and untouched jungles on the planet. My name's Adam Thorne. I'm an animal biologist and an expert in the field. I'm in a town in North Borneo, getting ready to start my journey for an animal so elusive and so bizarre, most people wouldn't even know it existed. Imagine a creature with the prehensile tail of a monkey, the claws of a cat, and the head of a bear. I'm in search of the bear cat. So I've come to a local village to uh, buy a boat, as we'll be starting the journey by a river. Now this is the boat, it's maybe 10 foot long, which kind of concerns me because some of the saltwater crocodiles in the river can be well bigger than this boat. And especially when your oar is a common garden rake. But it'll do. You need to make do with what you can get, especially in a place like this where resources are very limited. So let's get this guy on the water. In dense jungle and rainforests like those in Borneo, often the quickest and most efficient way to travel is by water. Now the rivers in Borneo do contain saltwater crocodiles and big saltwater crocodiles. And we've seen a few on the bank and one in the water over there. And I'm in a pretty small boat and saltwater crocodiles can exceed five and a half to six meters. So you get that sort of vulnerable feeling when you're with, sharing the water with something that big. So I've got to keep my eyes open and be very wary. Just looking for an entry point where it would be good to sort of dock the boat, leave it and head into the jungle because I think it's a fair walk through and there's a palm oil plantation so I'm going to try and get as deep in as possible so we don't have to walk as much to get to where we want to be. Well, looks like the river's come to a dead end, so it's all by foot from now on. Through this section of the jungle, we've got to walk through a palm oil plantation, and from there on, it's all jungle, and we can start our search for the bear cat. After a three hour trek through the plantation, we finally arrived at the jungle border. We've just walked through an entire palm oil plantation and this is the border where the plantation ends and the jungle begins. So we're going to hike two days out into the jungle. Looks like we're going to be going south into the, into the rainforest. We're going to loop around and hike another two days back. Now this border is going to be our rendezvous point. So we're going to hike back and once we hit this border, we'll know we're back in civilization. So this is where we're gonna start our quest. We only have four days to find the bear cat and reach our rendezvous point. From there, transport will be waiting to take us back to civilization. Bear cats are massive fans of figs. So if I can find a fig tree, hopefully I can find the bear cat. Bear cats are also commonly known as the Binturong, and they're the largest member of the civet family.
little skink. These dead and decaying logs are perfect homes for reptiles. They stay humid and they're sheltered from predators. And you have skinks like this guy living in them. He's actually a really nice looking skink. He's got blue on his neck, yellow belly. Cool little skink. All right, all right, let's settle down. Oh, we'll pop him back. There's about 110 different species of lizard on this island and about 40% of those are skinks. Another little skink. Bloody everywhere. Oh, off you go. The leaf litter here is crawling with insects, and some of these bugs I've never seen before in my life. It is possible that they could even be new species. Look at the size of that tree. When a tree falls down in the forest, eventually it decays. And when it decays, it creates habitat for hundreds of organisms which live on the jungle floor. This is another thing why rainforests and jungles can be quite dangerous. Because trees just fall down. Bang, and you can hear them a mile away, sound like a shotgun going off. But with a fallen tree like this, it creates a diverse range of new life. When there's a gap missing in the canopy, that allows sunlight to penetrate into the jungle floor, which allows life to just thrive. So on this fallen tree alone, you can even see there's plants growing off it, even new trees growing off it, and all around it as well. It's definitely a circle of life factor that's very evident in fallen down trees. It's pretty cool. After the rains, much of the forest floor turns into mud. This gives us the advantage of being able to see the tracks of animals that could be in the area. See the ground has been all trampled and dug up. And there's a lot of broken trees around, which suggests to me that there's elephants in the area, which could be potentially very dangerous. So we've got to keep our eyes out Make sure we don't startle any elephants because they'll kill you pretty easily. The Bornean pygmy elephant is the smallest elephant in the world, but it can still weigh several tons. And it was only in 2011 an Australian veterinary student was gored to death by one of these elephants. It's difficult to search the trees for the binturong, but also you got to focus on the floor because there's so much stuff crawling on the floor that could possibly harm me as well as in the trees. I just wish I had another set of eyes. This is a coral snake, a Malaysian blue coral snake. And this is the Bornean subspecies, Tetratania. And they're very distinguishable by the bright red heads and the bright red tails and look at the belly bright red now these are very very venomous snakes and they inject a very powerful neurotoxic venom which shuts down the nervous system stops the lungs breathing and the heart pumping and they are deadly snakes but they are also very beautiful snakes look at the colors on them look at that Look how amazing it is. The brighter colours in nature often mean stay away from me, I'm deadly and I'll kill you. Now these guys eat almost exclusively on blind snakes, which are smaller snakes that burrow underground. And he's calmed down quite a bit. They're normally nocturnal and they're more active at night. Oh, he's lovely. Lovely snake, good find as well. Beautiful. Now coral snakes in North America 
look completely different to these guys. Their bands go sideways across, and they're yellow, black, and red. These guys don't look anything alike. They're actually not even related, not even the same genus. Lovely snake. Awesome. Let him on his way. Coral snakes possess more toxic venom than a cobra and should be treated with extreme caution. Being in such a remote location with no help for miles, a bite from one of these snakes would probably result in death. Jungles are always full of setbacks and even the little things can cause delays in progress. Now you gotta watch out for these things. They don't look like much, but look what happens. Bang, stuck straight in your skin. Look at that. They're like fishing hooks. And they get caught in your clothes and your hair. And there's just tiny little teeth that are razor sharp. And they're the most annoyingest thing when you're trying to get through the jungle because look, they just attach to everything. Man, they're annoying. You really need to be careful where you put your hands because nearly every plant here comes well equipped, either with spikes, barbs, thorns, or even a resident colony of ants, which can pack a pretty painful bite. Although jungles have their setbacks, you can always find something to flush away the frustration. I can see a sunbed. I think there might actually be two sun bears down there. They're also known as the honey bear, and they're the smallest bear in the world. They can get to maybe heights of about five foot. And although they're a small bear, the claws on them are like that, and they do have big teeth. Now, some bears, like most bears, are mainly vegetarian, but they will take small animals and even scavenge. Oh, that's amazing. Some bears are pretty endangered. They're just sort of heading off, they're a bit wary. But I heard them before I could see them. They were going, and that's them communicating each other. I think they're eating something down there. But there's definitely two of them. Oh man, that's awesome. All right, there's a few hours left of daylight, maybe an hour and a half, two hours, so I've got to look for somewhere to sleep. So I'm looking for a large tree with a big root system to make a shelter. And there's quite a few of them around, so I'll just find one. So this tree here looks pretty good. Oh yeah, this is perfect, this one. And what I want is the gap in between these two big roots. So actually this one looks actually better. So that's where I'll start building my shelter. So I'm gonna start by clearing a bit of a space in between these roots. Start with this guy. That can go. All these little things can go. This one will be good as a uh, support beam over the top. So I'll save that one. And you can go, because I'm just going to trip up on you. All right. So now we're going to start looking for pillars for either side of these roots. And they're going to hold and be the support for the leaves that I'm going to stack on the top. So I've got one of my support branches. I'm going to stick him in about here. Just putting a split in the top. And then we can have our beams running across. And now I'm going to stack things over and up. 
and that'll be the roof. Alright, shelter's done. I mean, it's not the prettiest of, uh, of huts, but it'll do. I mean, I'm already drenched with sweat and rain anyway, so if it pours torrentially, I will get wet, but what's an extra bit of water, hey? But tonight, I'm going to build a fire, find some kindling, and that'll hopefully keep some of the insects away from me while I'm sleeping. And, uh, yeah, let's see how the night goes. Most of the animals in Borneo are nocturnal, so at night, I decided to do some spotlighting. This is a little tree frog. I'm not sure exactly what species it is. But they come out when it gets dark and eat the insects. And after the rains, the floor is nearly littered with these guys and other species of frogs. But he's a tree frog and you can tell because of the pads on his feet and his sort of slender build. Looks like you preferred the pond. <laughs> when you're walking through the jungle at night, there's this really creepy feeling that you're being watched from all directions. I mean, you're probably being watched by about a million things, but you can hear like crashing in a tree over there, something walking through the forest over there, and you don't know what it is, and it's very, very eerie. At night, the jungle is flourishing with life, and even small puddles can be good habitat for micro-monsters. That is a water scorpion, and they're a very formidable predator, especially to stuff like frogs, insects, and even tadpoles. Now, if you're an insect living in this water, you would want to stay well away. They're like the lions of the pond. They're very dangerous creature to smaller animals. When you're going through the jungle at night, you need to check every single branch you go through because there's vipers and other venomous snakes sitting on the branches. Oh, what the hell? What the? That's exactly what I'm talking about. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Not venomous, not dangerous, but he's come off a branch and onto my shoulder. <laughs> Perfect example. Check every branch you go under. I promise you that scene was not set up. It was just a crazy coincidence. But a perfect example of the animals that are living in these trees and are out at night. so common in Southeast Asia. They're probably, I'd say Southeast Asia's most famous lizard, the Tokay Gecko. They're called the Tokay Gecko because they go poke, poke. That's how they vocalize. He's just shedding his skin, look at that. Really nice. They shed maybe five or six times a year. And they don't come off all in one, like snake skin. It comes off in sort of patches. Yeah, getting a bit defensive. Now, he just dropped his tail, which is a defense mechanism with geckos. I do kind of feel bad when they drop their tails because it's another form of defense they don't have. But nothing in nature is wasted. We'll pop him back. Alright, spent the night here last night. Wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. It only rained a little bit. But the insects, of course, are pretty bad, but you gotta expect that. Yesterday I found this turtle carapace, and I decided to use it as a little rain catcher, just get some extra water, so I'm not using it straight from my bottle. Got about 200 ml of water, which isn't too bad. Tastes a bit turtley, but oh well. Now for breakfast, instead of carrying around 
copious amounts of food. It's going to have your general protein powder. That'll keep my calories up, keep my protein intake up, which is important so you're not burning muscle as you walk. And I've seen a few jackfruit trees around and durian trees, so that'll serve as my carbohydrates, give me energy and the sugars I need, as well as vitamins and minerals to get me through the day. So I'll find one of them and crack into one. And that'll be my food. Let's get into it. Got some lunch. This is a jackfruit and it's a little bit underripe, but oh well, I'm a bit hungry. So, cut into him. This isn't the best tool for cutting these sort of fruits open. I'm in the jungle. I don't really have any choice in the matter. Okay. All right, there's all that flesh. It's all good to eat. Not bad, considering it's not ripe. <laughs> Jungle lunch. Jackfruit is very high in potassium, which helps restore electrolytes. It is also a great source of vitamin C and carbohydrates for energy. When walking in the jungle, you need all the nutrients you can get. We're looking for bear cats. You need to check the trees, because they're mainly an arboreal animal. And they can't cross from tree to tree like primates can. They have to come down to the forest floor and move from tree to tree. And while they're on the floor, they'll forage for food. Borneo is never short on surprises. And I was lucky enough to share a very special moment with a very special creature. An orangutan. An orangutan. Isn't a wild First time seeing an orangutan in the wild. That is orangutan, the man of the forest. And a wild orangutan in Borneo. This is the first thing. Absolutely amazing. Hey buddy, where are you going? A bit wary at the moment. He's definitely not used to having people around. And I'm not used to having orangutans around, but. They are the largest arboreal animal in the world. And if you've ever seen two trucks find it, it's going on about her business, eating these. I'm a 
absolutely stoked just seeing an orangutan which probably will be extinct within my lifetime and seeing one in the wild it's just giving me goosebumps I'm absolutely speechless I don't know what to say it's absolutely amazing I mean to see an animal that much like us and that big just passing through the forest within a meter of you it's absolutely invigorating this just made my day Orangutans are only found on two places on Earth, Sumatra and Borneo. And in the last 50 years, over half of the Bornean orangutan population has been wiped out. Borneo is home to more tree-dwelling animals than anywhere else on Earth. A huge amount of animals here are arboreal, which means they live in trees. Perfect example, a temple pit viper. In my last documentary, Temple of the Viper, I found two of these guys in the wild, but they weren't anywhere near as big as this one. So I'm going to try to get him out because I'm really interested to have a play with him. I'll probably just have to shake him out of the tree. There it goes. Sorry, buddy. Bit aggro, but you'd be too if you're just shaking out of your tree. Hey, vipers have gigantic fangs, huge fangs. Now these guys are venomous, but they might not be able to kill you, but they'll make you very sick. And they're very fast striking snakes as you can see. I'm sorry. Sorry I disturbed you, mate. Easy. There he is. He's a big one. Very fat one. Healthy. Oh, he's beautiful. Now, if you saw my last documentary, Temple of the Viper, you'll notice a difference in coloration between these ones and the ones in Penang. These ones are much more green. Whoa, he is a heavy, heavy viper. Tropodolamus wagleri. It's the scientific name of these guys. Oh, cool. I'm sorry I shook you out of your tree. And the more people get to know about animals like this, the more they'll understand and respect them. So although I've disturbed him for a few minutes. If I can educate people and show them how beautiful they are, you know, it might stop one being killed in the future. Or someone to look twice in the tree they're walking under. It's all right. Let him on his way. Pop him back up his tree. He's done what he needs to do. Hey, don't be naughty. Come on. Go up your tree. Searching the trees has definitely paid off. 
However, the Bearcat is still maintaining its reputation as being very elusive. Finally, we find a clue which may lead us to the Bearcat. Just come across some prints in the mud. Now, they're not from a cat. They're not from a monitor lizard. They're starting to look very bear catty to me. The way you can see the claws, the shape of the toes, and they're leading this direction along this game trail here. They look fresh too. So hopefully we can track him down. But it's gonna be pretty difficult in this dense jungle. The rainforest proved to be too dense and I soon lost the bear cat's trail, so it's back to searching the trees. This is a kill-bellied whip snake. Now they're not toxically venomous to people, but they are mildly venomous. They're what's called a culibrid, which means back fanged. So their fangs are at the back of their mouth. Now these guys are diurnal, which means they're active during the day. And he'll feed on skinks, geckos, small frogs, Anything that'll fit in his mouth, pretty much. He's amazing. They're also called vine snakes, because a lot of the times they just look like a vine in the tree. And one of their defense mechanisms is they'll poke their tongue out and keep it straight. Beautiful snake. If he bit me, it might feel like a bee sting or something like that, something similar but they've also got scent glands in their cloaca and he's just stunk me out. But can you blame him really? It's bedtime for you, mate. near as big as I can get. Whoa, this is a reticulated python. The longest species of snake in the world. Whoa, whoa, whoa. And these are a constrictor. They're not venomous. They kill their prey by constricting him, just like he's doing to my hand. And when the animal breathes out, it will tighten his grip, so the animal can't breathe in again, and then dies from asphyxiation. But these are the longest species of snake on the planet. They can get to lengths of nearly 10 meters. And they're beautiful snake. They're called the reticulated python because these netting-like patterns on their body and you can see the iridescence on them, they're beautiful, which is why they're also known as the regal python, because they are quite regal looking snakes. And he's about, oh, maybe nine foot in length. And these are known man eaters. There has been pretty reliable reports of these species of snake killing and consuming human beings, which is a pretty scary thought. But they're not the heaviest bodied snake, that title belongs to the green anaconda. Although these guys, when they get six meters plus, get me that thick. He's a beautiful, beautiful python. Now, although they're not venomous, they do contain about a hundred razor sharp teeth, all pointing backwards. 
So when they grab onto their prey, the prey's not going anywhere. They got a hold on it. And they dislocate their jaws and can swallow prey much, much bigger than their heads. He would be eating mouse deer, big rats, monitor lizards. And a snake this size, if he got around my neck, could probably potentially kill me. Any snake over 10 foot, you wouldn't really wouldn't want to have it alone, especially when it's wild. Oh. I was hoping I'd find a reticulated python while I was here in Borneo. I'm really glad I did. You're right. You're right, big heart. So there they go. Come on. If she wants to go, that's a very threatened snake. That's why it's doing that. Just gonna unwind it. As of 2013, the largest reticulated python in captivity is Medusa. She's nearly 26 feet long and weighs 160 kilograms. Reticulated pythons are fantastic swimmers and they've been found far out at sea. This ability to swim so well has helped these snakes colonize many islands, especially around the Indonesian archipelago. My time in the jungles of Borneo is nearly over and I still haven't found the bear cat. Although the bear cat has managed to remain hidden from me, I still have found amazing animals on this journey and I've had experiences that I'll remember for the rest of my life. Definitely the palm oil plantation we originally entered the jungle from. And we did one gigantic loop through the jungle. And now it looks like we're back. Back in civilization. As our driver is taking us to the airport, we get news that a nearby wildlife facility has captured a bear cat and is holding it in captivity. We were given special permission to enter the bear cat's enclosure and get a close encounter with the animal. So this is the bear cat. Bearcats are usually shy animals, but have been known to be quite inquisitive at times. She seems to be just as curious about me as I am of her. This is the bearcat of Borneo, the Bintaram. Mm -hmm. This is what we're in the jungle with. Yeah. The largest member of the civet family. Mm. Such a beautiful looking animal. Look at the eyes on them. They've almost got like an otter body with long shaggy hair. And that head does look very bear like, and you can see why they're called the bear cat. And those footprints we saw in the mud while we we're in the jungle definitely matches the feet he's got. Those big claws, just the sheer size of them. And they get bigger than this. This is a female. Males get a lot bigger, up to 25 kilograms, about 50 pounds. 
and they can reach over five feet in length. And that huffing and puffing he's doing is trying to warn me off. He's not very happy, he feels kind of cornered. The scent of a bear cat has often been described as a strong smell of popcorn. Although I didn't find a bear cat in the wild, I still felt so privileged to be able to spend some time with such an amazing and bizarre creature. That is the bear cat of Borneo.